to have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Exodus uh, 13, beginning in verse uh, 13. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 13. Exodus 33, and verse 13, the Bible says, Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, shew me now by way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in, the, in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For, it, for wherein shall it be known that I, had, I and my people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are on the, upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech, ye, I beseech thee, shew me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will shew mercy unto whom I will shew mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for, when, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word, Lord. We thank you that it lays before us in uh, the language, the English language and the in the way that you give it to us, Lord, we pray for people that have rejected it. God, this morning we pray that you, we would see you in some way, Lord, that you'd be lifted up, that you would be cause your people to become nearer for you, and Lord, we pray for the lost, that you might speak life to them, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and we'll be preaching this morning on the a glimpse of God's glory. Now, there's been a couple of times in my life that I've just got a glimpse of how great God really is, and when we do that, we're drawn closer unto the Lord. Now, uh, I don't mean a visual glimpse, I mean things He's done in my life, and things that he's brought me through that I now I now understand the nature of God a little bit better. Now, you think about Moses and how, how closely he traveled uh, with the Lord God, and yet he, uh, he wanted to see his glory. Now, first of all, to see any portion of the glory of God, you must be saved. Now, I personally believe that Moses was saved on the backside of Mount Moriah when he was over there with those sheep, and and, and the and the Lord came on to come to him. He says, "You're standing on holy ground," and he said, "Who are you?" See, he had never met God before. He'd been religious, but he had never met God before, and, and so we see then that. In that way, Moses ignited something in him. It placed something in him that he never got over. Now, if your salvation hasn't placed something in you that you never got over, you better be careful because you may not have what you think you have. You know what? I've seen a lot of people come and go, and they act like they love the Lord so much, and they're in like plan, and in three years you can't find them a read on. Now, I don't have any confidence in testimony like that. 
But we see that Moses was not on that wise, but rather instead he wanted more and more of the Lord God. You know what? One of the best measures of your own salvation, do you want more and more preaching? Do you want more and more church time? Do you want to know more and more about the great God of the Bible? And if you're satisfied, uh, I, I put a question mark to my salvation because our day of satisfaction, the day that we're satisfied is still ahead. Uh, I'll be satisfied when I'm resting in the presence of the Lord. Right. When I get there, I'll be satisfied. Until then, uh, uh, you know, uh, I I'll just I I'll just continue wanting to be closer and closer and closer to the Lord. Now, back to our text in the uh, 13th verse, we begin to see that Moses asked for a number of things from God. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight. Now, I want you to see, first of all, Moses, just like us, sometimes question things a little bit. He says, if I have found grace. You ever go through your salvation experience to be sure that you've tasted of the grace of God? If you haven't, I would, because the Bible says make your calling and election sure. And, and so he says, if I found grace, you know what? I fully believe Moses did, and, he, and he, he knew the God of the Bible, according to all the records we have here, but he wanted to be reassured that he knew God in the way that he thought. Now he says, now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, shew me now thy way. In other words, you show me the way that I wanted to go. I, I, I want to know your way. And listen, he wasn't talking about getting over into the promised land. He wanted guidance for his personal life so he could lead the nation in the way that he should. And you know what? What I want more than anything else is guidance in my personal life, that I will understand and know who God is, that I can follow him in the ways that I should, and then in seeing that, I can lead my family and my church if I know. See, it would be very, it would be very sound advice for, for me this morning to give to you that you do the very same thing and you look you look like he did, shoo me thou thy way. That I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. Now notice he just said, if I have found, now he says again, and you know, and that second grace, uh, not knowing the person of God, I believe that second grace he asked him about is grace to live. Listen, me and some of the brethren were having talk between service. Listen, we ain't seen nothing yet. And you know what? There's going to take a special kind of grace to get through this. See, grace is not just salvation. Grace will be with you the rest of your life. Amen. And there'll be situations where there's no way out when God parts your Red Sea. And you know what? When it happens, just run across dry shot. We, uh, listen, our government is literally falling apart. And you know what? I'm not too surprised because the United States is not in end time prophecy. So if we go away, we go away. But see, a after you think about that, you know, uh, where will that leave us? I don't know. But I do know this, just in the rhetoric of the recent government decisions, they've come out just bland that they're against us. They've set their beat on us. And so we, uh, we as the Lord's people, we need to be prepared for that. And what, what he wanted, what Moses wanted, was an ongoing grace relationship with the Lord. Then he says at the end of that verse, and consider that this nation is thy people. In other words, you remember, you, you, you consider, now, I personally don't believe that there was very many of them saved at all. 
In fact, if I understand the scriptures right, I think Moses, Caleb, and Joshua pretty much wound up the, the, the truly saved out of the four and a half million people. Now, God was, was patient with the rest, and he gave him, and they, he provided food. But, you know, he does that for the heathen. And, uh, and and so we learned that um, uh, Moses was really, I think, and maybe he was cognizant of it. Maybe he wasn't. He was just he was just praying that they have a living grace that the Lord would sustain them. And they were such a rebellious, hard people. I I have no confidence that they knew the Lord. Verse fourteen. And he said, "My presence." The Lord God answers him, "My presence shall go with thee." What a rich a wonderful promise, my presence will go with thee. You remember uh, just uh, just in that 40-day uh, window when God stayed here, I mean, when Jesus stayed here after the resurrection and he taught his disciples and he encouraged his disciples, and about the time to leave out, he says, I'm going to send you a comforter. And that was the Holy Ghost. See, this prayer, this uh this promise that he makes to Moses is very likely to be, and I will go with him. In other words, I'm going to reassure you. I'm going to be there in the good times and the bad times. All that way, I will be with thee. And you know what? I fully believe uh, in the modern day, as long as we serve him and we don't err from this book, and you see you see, so-called churches all around us, it's both going after heresy. And, and, and you know, uh, I believe at that point God departs from them. I really do. <laughs> and... But we have a promise. Moses had the promise. He says, I'm with you. I'll be there. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, Moses, back to God, if thy presence go not with me, carry, carry us not, not up hence. And I believe what Moses was saying, listen, I'm not going to make a step unless I consult you. You know, what, what a rich life we would have if we could take that attitude. Amen. I, I'm not going to take the first step and, and before I said, is this all right with you, God? Is this all right? Is it the best thing for my family? Is it the best thing uh, for uh, my wife? Is it the best thing that I need to do? Because, you know, when we get out there on our own, what I've seen in every circumstance, I don't care how any good anybody thinks they are, their natural path leads away from God. Yeah, that's right. And so we, we need to make some consultation, don't we? And, and that's what uh, Moses wanted from himself. And he says, listen, if it don't come from you, I don't want to go. And, and what a rich, godly, uh, godly example that he was for the people. Verse 15, uh, I mean, verse 16 for wherein, this is Moses still speaking to God, for wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? In other words, how do I know I'm in your will? How do I know that grace is continuing? How do I know that, that your leadership is still among us? How do I know that? That was Moses' question for God. Is it not, he had this in his mind, is it not in that thou goest with us? Absolutely. You, you want to take a barometer and you want to take a measure of some kind of your closeness to God? The only one I know is he with, is he with you. Yeah. Is the Holy Spirit with you? And, and you know, don't look at me like a horse at a newborn door. You know if he is or not, if you're really saved. And you know what? We, we know when he departs, too, do we not? You know, the thing about the Holy Spirit, and I understand what people say when they say this, that the day we're saved, we have a measure, the, the same measure of the Holy Ghost that we always will. And I know what they're saying, and I think they're trying to promote and make people understand security as a believer. And I get that. But you know what? There's been lots of days in... Uh, in my life, at least, the Holy Ghost was no near, nowhere near me. I couldn't find him with radar. And you know what? It's always me. That's right. It's always me. So uh, 
uh, I'm not saying your salvation is questionable, but see, every time I've been in that uh, in that situation, I've always got a good whipping from the, the Almighty, and it brings me back, just like a good whipping from your mother brings you in back into safety, right? And, and so we see then that uh, he makes this promise unto the Almighty. Uh, I mean, the Almighty makes him promise unto him and says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be, I'm going to sustain you. So shall we be separated. If God's with us, now notice what it says, if not, uh, not in that thou goest with us, I know we're saved, I know we're your people because your, pre your presence is with us. And then he said, so shall we be separated from all the world. In other words, if God's with you, you're going to be separated. You're not going to desire the things of this world anymore. And when you get out of God's will, you know what? You'll suck up this uh, world like a pig in slop. So that's a good barometer for you this morning. Do you have your things, uh, your things on the mind, your eyes on the things of this world, or do you have your mind on the things of God? Because, uh, listen, if, if your mind's out here, one thing I can say is you're out of the will of God. Yeah. Are you lost one? Yeah. And so we as the Lord's people, uh, we need to praise God like Moses did. If he's with you, if he's guiding you, then, the, uh, then you should give him great glory and honor for it. Then he says, I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Verse 17, and the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight. So he asked for the security of the nation, and then the Lord answers him, God answers him, well, I will because of you. In other words, you know, he was their advocate like Jesus is to us. And he didn't do it because the people were good people. He didn't do it because they were following him as a nation. He did it, they, he did it on behalf of the grace that was uh, interposed to Moses. Yeah. You know what? God didn't save you because you're so good. He saved you on the grace interposed by Christ. And uh, very same situation we're in today. And, and so, again, I think that nation was mostly rebellious and ungodly, but because Moses asked for it, God granted it. That is a type of, a, that's a type unto Christ. Verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, shew me thy glory. Now, I tell you, this is another good measure of your salvation. Do you want to see the Lord? Because, see, I mean, he just been validated in everything he said. And then Moses said, I, I want to see you. I, I want to experience you. I, I want to see you in detail. Do you ever get like that with the Lord? Man, sometimes in praying time and listening to the Lord's music, I just get to the point I'd rather be there than here. Do you? And see, that's what Moses was experiencing. He says, I want to see you. Now, we'll see in a minute that God's answer was this. No man can see God and live. And you know, the Bible, the Bible uh, uh, shows that that's true. It, it, it comes out that that's true every time. Because remember when old Stephen was being stoned and he said, uh, I, I see the heavens open and, and, and the Son standing at the right hand of the Father. And he had already seen him, so his time was done. And, and if you follow that scripture, it didn't say he got knocked in the head with a rock and killed it, it said he fell asleep. So you know what? I believe after he seen God, that was, that was it. He went on home to be with the Lord. And, and so we find that Moses was very minded unto God. He was very concerned about his relationship with the Lord. And because he was concerned, he says, listen, I just want to see you. I, I want to understand who you are. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, one more thing on that verse and we'll move on. See, he had already seen God in his works, but he wanted to see God literally. You know what? 
I've seen God in His works time and time and time again. Brought my family through so much, saved my never dying soul, placed me in one of His true churches time and time again. See, I've seen Him that way. And Moses had too. Listen, you talk about parting the Red Sea and running across on the sand. I mean, that's something of God, is it not? But he wanted to see him literally. He wanted to see his glory. You know what? That, that's a desire of those that believe, is it not? Yeah. That's a desire uh, of someone that's really put their heart and soul into what they believe. And so he, he said, I, I just want to see you. I just want to, I want to experience you with these two eyes. And that was his request. Verse 19, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious. Now, he begins to say and kind of delineate how he was going to present himself to Moses. Now, we, we see that he would not present to Moses in his entirety. Now, he says, first of all, I'm going to pass my goodness before you. You know what? Whew, there's so much to God than just his goodness, isn't it? His salvation, his grace, and, and the part that nobody else wants to hear about is judgment and his fury. Uh, you know, he hates sin still today. Very much. You know, uh, I always heard, well, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. You have to show me that in the Bible. Right? You know what he says? He says concerning Esau, <laughs> he, served, uh, he, he said, Esau, have I hated? And you know what that means? That means he hated him. And so we find then that uh, according to the word of God, he was going to present himself in a very special way. He says, first of all, you're going to see my goodness. My goodness passed before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. In other words, as he's standing there before him, you know, uh, it doesn't really record it. I don't know what he said. I am Jehovah. I'm Jehovah John Real. I am. Uh, you know what he said to the nation of Israel? He, when he was getting him out, he said, you just tell him I am sent you. And so uh, when he was walking around saying his name, all the names that the Bible refers to the mighty God of heaven, the God of Israel, Jehovah, you know, uh, I bet he spurted out every one of them. Just walking right by him. See, uh, I'll declare my name unto you. You know, isn't it a wonderful thing when uh, the story of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes more than a story and he manifests himself to you? Amen. See, that's what Moses was experiencing. He was going to see it up. He was going to see a portion of God. I will proclaim thy name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on, uh, on him whom I will show mercy. Now, listen. If that's not divine election from the beginning, I don't know what it is. He says, it's my choice, not yours. I'm going to show you myself. And I'm going to reveal myself to you. Because I want to. God wants to. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And so he was very honest about this. Now think of who we're speaking of, and that's God the Father. You know, there were a number of people that saw Christ and lived. Some of them lived up to old age. John the Apostle leaned on his breast and said, It's an eye. And he was just a 15 year old kid at that time. And he lived another 70 something years. And so you can see there were some when Jesus ministered. Now, don't get me wrong, you can't see Jesus now because the Bible said he's our advocate at the right hand of the Father. And he's still in that position today. You know, that's where he stood up to welcome old Stephen home. And he's still there today. That's why the active agent that Baptists minimize so much, and I don't get it, is the Holy Ghost. That's our means to God today. It, it's not, except for the redemptive blood of Christ, your means to talk to the Father is the Holy Spirit. 
and it, he done, he going to be in there. And so we find that just like us today, uh, <clears throat> the, the crosses hasn't changed. You cannot see the glory of Jehovah. And then this is God's plan. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me. Whew, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful thing to live in. There is a place by me. Listen, he's going to get in that place and he's going to see the hinder parts of God. And you know where we need to be? Where that place is. There's a place by me. You know what? I never want to run out on my own. I never want to do nothing foolish, start a church or anything on my own. I, I, want, I want God, the Holy Spirit, right here saying, Larry, this is the next step. And then you go right and then you turn left and go by him all along the way. Because you know what? That leadership is there if we listen. If we listen. And, and, and so we find then that in the very same way that uh, God had a plan and said, I'm, I, I, I'll be the son. I shall, it shall come to pass that my glory passes by. I'm sorry, verse 21. There's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Now, isn't, isn't that interesting that... Uh, 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 a number of years later, probably 3,000 years later, that uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. And, and so he says here, he said, stand upon a rock. You know what you need to do today, more than anything else in the things of God, you need to stand upon that word. Listen, because, listen, the sodomites are going to go against you. Uh, the, the federal government's going to go against you. Right. You're going to be called a heretic. You're going to do this, and you're going to do that. But the Bible says this, stand upon the rock. Stay there. You know what? Uh, and she was Pentecostal. I don't even know what she said, but uh, there, there was a gospel singer. She's dead now called Priscilla Magruder. And she had a horrible cancer, stage four. Said there's no way you can survive. She went ahead with the chemo and she lived five years. But uh, when she was in the raw of the chemo, uh, her uh, husband thought she'd gone crazy because she laid her Bible down and she says, I'm standing on the rock. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a lot of truth in that. So the next time you have a challenge, you quote the scripture that you're standing on and say, hey, I'm not budging. I, I'm not moving anywhere. You know what? If the Bible says it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Uh, you, don't, you don't find many like that today, do you? Uh, that sway in the wind just like a uh, just like a piece of grass. Go where the get is good. And so we find that uh, what we should be doing is standing on the rock. Verse 22. And it, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by that I will put uh, I will put thee, now put thee, he wasn't going to put himself, he's standing on the rock, and God says, I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee, and with, and, and with my hand, and will pass by. You know, you hear the song saying, they're in the cleft of the rock. Well, let me tell you this morning, you're not in the cleft of the rock unless God puts you there. That, that, you know how we get protection? We still get protection by just standing on the rock. Right. Waiting for God's movement, waiting for him to put us in the right place, and then put that hand over us, and he passes by. You know, there's no other one in the Bible that ever did that. Moses. He was the only one. And you know what? One thing about, two things about Moses. First of all, he was a very, very humble man. He couldn't even talk plain. He had no self-pride at all. And I think that's why most of us uh, don't get an experience like that is because we're so prideful. Verse 23, I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And so he doesn't, he doesn't violate himself in the word. He keeps the word. No man shall see God and live, but yet he has such a close relationship now with Moses. He honors him to his death. Now, with that said, it's not going to be, and, and, and one time uh, the Bible said that he could strike the rock, which 
because uh, the, they were thirsty. There was no water anywhere. They were out in the desert. And if you remember, he entreated God. He says, they be ready to kill me. They're, they're, they're going to kill me because there's nothing out here. And he says, you go out to that dry, dusty rock and you strike it, and water will come forth. That's a type of striking Christ. That's a type of the Lord Jesus being crucified. Right. And then the next time when the people started the same junk, the Lord said, you go speak to the rock. <laughs> See, we, after true salvation, we can speak unto Christ, can't we? We can speak unto God. And through the person of Christ. And, and we can cry out, make our needs known, make praises known unto him. Uh, put it all out there. But you don't strike the rock again. Yeah. Salvation is eternal. Salvation is a work of God. You know, every work of God is eternal. So how somebody could advocate that salvation depends on you, I don't get <laughs> Because the works of God are eternal. But if you and, and you remember the story, and, and he, he ended up not seeing the promised land because of it. So you, it shows you the results of sin. And he went out there and he was so mad at the people, he slammed it down again. Yeah. And really, that's a type of putting Christ in open shame. That's right. And uh, so, and the water came out. But listen, Moses lost his relationship. It was, in fact, it was affected by what he did. And you know what? Your relationship with Christ is affected by what you do. Mm -hmm. People don't like that. You know what? They want to ride brace down like a, uh, like a bull and blame all, you know, well, you know what? I've been, uh, <laughs> I've been out in sin. You know, I smoke pot, but grace is still sufficient. I'm out uh, running around on my wife. But the grace is still, you know what? That just demeans Christ next to nothing. It, 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 it makes him mean nothing. You know, even the sodomites today, oh yeah, I know Jesus. Uh, and he understands how he made me. Well, uh, jury's still out on that one, but if, if they did, if God did make you that way, it's because you're a vessel of wrath. And, and, and he'll unload it one day. And, and, and so we see then that Moses was the perfect type of person who wanted to see God. Now, go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. This is probably a section of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll begin reading in the very first verse. Isaiah chapter 6 in the first verse. The Bible says, In the, king, in the year the king Uzziah died, I also saw, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train, his presence filled the temple. You know what? If you don't have an experience like that, I'd say that I, I would be very careful to think that I was saved. Because you know what? Made the difference. It wasn't no foolish little prayer. It wasn't coming forward in the building. You know why the Lord, how the Lord saved me? I saw Christ high and lifted up. I saw him the answer for my sin. I saw I caught a glimpse of his glory. And that is what salvation is about. If you've ever caught a glimpse of the glory of God, I would dare say you better make sure you've got a taste of grace. Now, I don't abide there, but in the right times when I'm praying, I'm seeking the face of God every once in a while, I get a little glimpse. And you know what that little glimpse makes me? It makes me more, desire more and more just to be home. Now, just put this stuff behind me. And, and, and so we find that uh, Isaiah, and you know what? Isaiah, either this was his salvation experience or he was just getting closer back to God. I, I really don't know which. I, I wonder, he, he was so mad and, I, and the writing in the first five chapters is so mean and hateful. I don't even know if he was saved then. This might have been his salvation experience. I don't know. But if he was an already saved man, man, he had an experience with God here. You, you know what? You need an As Isaiah chapter 6 experience every once in a while, don't you? Where you just see God for who he is, what, he, what he's about, what he's done for you. And that's exactly what Isaiah experienced here. Above it stood 
uh, the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And the one said unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Listen, what would you do this morning if I said holy and Jared answers me back, holy, and then uh, uh, Brother Stanfield answered Jared back, holy. We'd think everybody's going crazy, wouldn't we? But see, in the presence of God, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> and you know why the angels are doing it now? It's because we don't. <clears throat> right? And the uh, Bible says the angels are still at the work there at the throne of God even today. And they're praising him. And that's what John saw uh, as he looked into heaven, was it not? And then it says, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him, that cried and the house is filled with smoke and I said woe is, un woe is me for I'm not for I'm undone now I think that's a very interesting way to, to describe himself I don't know that if he was saying he's lost or if he was you know Donna's a big baker and, and when she's baking something you have to tiptoe through the kitchen I just try to stay in the living room and uh, uh, and you know why because the bread's undone it's not quite finished yet and you know what? I believe Isaiah saw that his ministry wasn't quite over. Or he saw that he was lost. I, I, I'm not sure which. But I do know this, that this situation impacted him for the rest of his life, that he was never quite the same. When you see the Lord Jesus Christ high and lifted up, you're never, not, you're never quite the same. Verse 4 says, And the post of the door moved with the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with, the, with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, now uh, who does the Bible describe as King? King of kings and Lord of lords. Is it not Christ? See, I think if this had been Jehovah God, oh, Isaiah's time would have been up. So I think he saw Christ. He saw the Lord. Because again, I think for the Lord to be consistent and the Almighty to be honest with himself, he took old Isaiah out if he'd seen Jehovah God. So I, I think he saw Christ because he identifies himself as king. You know, that, that term is not given to God. It's given to Jesus. And, and, and so we find then that uh, he sees him and he's overwhelmed in his mood. Notice what he says, though. He says, I, I have unclean lips. I'm not capable. I've never known a preacher really start out that thought they was capable. If they were, they were probably there on their own instead of under the movement of God. <laughs> And uh, uh, he felt inadequate. He felt like he couldn't do it. You know what? That's very likened unto Moses, is it not? That's pretty much what Moses said. He said and God got mad and said, shoot, I'll give you eight. And he kind of got out of the will of the Lord. And so we find then that Isaiah knew who he was now. Verse 6, <laughs> Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand. Imagine that was very painful, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar, and he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, thy iniquity is taken away. So again, maybe he was saved at this occasion, and, uh, and thy sin purged. And I heard, of the voice, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here I am, send me, send me. See, his whole attitude had been changed, hadn't it? He became from being just really haughty and judgmental till he had a drive to go for Jesus. Whatever Jesus wanted, he was good with it. And, and you know, uh, he, he told Israel what they were right down to the end. That's a, that's a good testimony, isn't it? And, and so we see that his experience with the Lord Jesus Christ 
uh, was very real. It, it left something done. When you get a glimpse of God's glory, it will make a difference in your life forever. And if you've not experienced that, I would uh, I would look at myself real closely. Uh, Gospel of Luke. We'll bring it down to the New Testament and we'll close. Uh, Luke chapter 9. This was way, late in the Lord Jesus' ministry. I'm going down to verse 28. Luke 9, verse 28. This would be just about a week before he went into Jerusalem for the final time and to be offered. And uh, in verse 29, he says, And he prayed, uh, I'm sorry, verse 28, And it came to pass about an, uh, about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, the ones he selected was the cream of the crop. Uh, the one, you know, I, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I believe John, I mean, excuse me, Peter was probably one of the first that was genuinely saved because he said, Thou art the Christ, Matthew 16, the Son of the living God. See, and, and, and he said, Blessed are thou, Simon and Jonah, for flesh and blood not revealed it. You know what? I've often wondered what the Camelots did to say, would say with that one. Flesh and blood not revealed it uh, unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Yeah. And you know how it gets revealed today? Through the Holy Spirit, because he's our working agent. And, 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 and so we find, we find that Moses, I mean, excuse me, we find that uh, the selection, you know, in other words, this, if you really want to be, uh, if you really want to see God, you serve him like you want to see him. See him. If you want to have an experience of closeness with him, you have to mean it. Then I want you to see next, they weren't set told. Now, when I get up here, you're going to see my glory. They went up there for prayer meeting. You ever get sick of Wednesday night services? That's a prayer meeting. You know, the, the, they called them back in the 40s. They'd meet and pray about the war. And they started calling it prayer meeting. Um, you know, you, you can't get sick of it and serve God. You just can't. Uh, you have to be consistent. Sunday morning and you know, we used to have Sunday night services instead of the meal. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. See, you're going to miss something if you're not here. And so he chooses the cream of the crop and says, uh, uh, you three come with me because I want to go pray. And then I want you to see also the climb to mountain. You know what? I ask you this. Have you ever climbed a mountain? I have one time. And you know what? It was an unusual experience. And uh, I, I was right behind uh, Matthew and Andrew. And uh, got, we were going along. And uh, Andrew says, Brother Lafferty, I can't believe, believe you've made it that far. And I, I don't know what that said about what his thoughts were of me. But he was impressed. And, and we got on top of that mountain. And you know what? Had a snowball fight with Andrew and Matthew on July the 4th. See, there was an unusual experience at the top, wasn't it? And you know what? When we put enough effort into servants of God, there's, special, there, there, there's a special experience coming. Right. And when we just do mediocre, you're going to get mediocre. You know, uh, there's a big difference between homemade biscuits and canned biscuits, isn't it? But the homemade biscuits takes a little bit more time and effort, do they not? And um, so we find that he's on top. They had to climb a mountain. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elisha, and appeared in glory and spake to his decease, which would be one week away, his death, 
which he would that he should accomplish at Jerusalem. <laughs> but Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. Now, does this sound familiar to you? Well, it should, because a week later he says, "Stand, stand here and pray while I go yonder. Stand here and watch while I go yonder." And he comes back and find, finds them all asleep. He said, "What?" Could you not wait with me one hour? And he went back over again. He prayed for another hour. And he run back and he said, sleep on. You, you ever wondered if the Lord said that to you? You want to be now? Just sleep on. You know, I think we miss a lot of good things because we get spiritual sleepy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's exactly what was happening here. And... Uh, so they're all out. God's meeting with Moses and our Jesus meeting with, God, with Moses and Elijah. But Peter, when they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. See, when we wake up and when we pay attention and we're, we're on point with the Lord, we're going to see his glory. You know what? You know, I fully believe this. The days of miracles are not ceased. You know what that is? That's a Southern Baptist heresy. And uh, the problem is it's not the ability for God to, to, to uh, perform miracles. Our problem is that we're asleep. We're asleep, and we miss them. You know what? If the house is on fire and you don't hear the fire alarm and you sleep through it, you're going to be toasted. And so sometimes we miss things just because. And, you know, old Big Mount Peter got to go in. <laughs> I don't know if he wasn't thinking straight because he just woke up or what. But he said, Let us be in here three tabernacles one for thee, one for Elisha, and one for Moses. And the minute he said that, the other two were gone, and the Lord God Almighty said, Behold my son. See, that's what we need, isn't it? Just a good look at Jesus. We see time and time again where God manifests himself in a special way, times of trouble times of difficulty, and listen, our nation's in a mess. I, I want to see him, don't you? I want to see him and things he does for me. And one day, should I, I not be part of the people taping, you know, put me out here, I hope right before I go, I, I look up and I see him. Now, I don't exactly know the veracity, the truthfulness behind that, but in nursing, you hear a lot of things. And uh, I have a friend, she doesn't practice anymore. Her name's Kay. And she and I were two or three different places over here. She's a registered nurse. And she was working the ER over at McKenzie. Donna used to work there years ago. And um, uh, she said this boy came in, older man, and they was working on him. And finally they saw what wasn't that going to be done. And he was out of it. And right before he went out, he raised up his head and said, Wow, wow, wow. And he was gone. See, he seen something, I guess, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I know this. Stephen saw it. Sure. And so uh, it's definitely in the realm of possibility. Sure. See, I want to see Jesus in everything that's done. I, I, I want to see him in the grass sprouting up. I want him to see him in the snow falling. And in those private times of prayer, I want him to show up and minister to me. What's your situation this morning? Have you seen him? When's the last time you've experienced that you knew Christ was here? That you knew the Holy Ghost was speaking to you directly through his work and through your prayers? Um, that's a good place to be in.